First came The Chosen and then Sound of Freedom. And now from Angel Studios comes The Shift. It hits theaters on December 1st. And I have that film's producer, Ken Carpenter, and his star, Christopher Palaha, with me on CIA Contagious Influencers of America. And that idea of like every time we make a decision, this new version of us branches out. There's a new world that we exist in and, and the idea. So it's a brilliant story. It's a really hard, it's not an easy pitch. There's no elevator pitch, but I guarantee you, um, based on his experience with trauma and grief, based on the book of Job, where you see this character just get hammered and God allows it to happen and we're tested, but then obviously Job you know, gets all back. You see this thing and it takes place in the movie. Christopher Palaha stars along with Neil McDonough, Jason Marsden, and Sean Astin in the thriller The Shift, coming to theaters on December the 1st. And of course, you probably recognize Christopher. He was one of the uh, stars in Wonder Woman 1984, Jurassic World Dominion, Mad Men, and he is a staple on the Hallmark Channel. He's on there all the time as in one of the starring roles. So, so uh, he's uh, what a cast this is. What a movie. It comes from our friend Ken Carpenter and, of course, Angel Studios, who brought us uh, Sound of Freedom, uh, His Only Son, uh, The Chosen. I mean, these guys are hit makers. And this movie comes to theaters on December 1st. It's a thriller. It's a drama. It will keep you on the edge of your seat. Let's take a look. What happened? From the studio that brought you Sound of Freedom. Nice to finally meet you, Kevin. Where did everybody go? They didn't go anywhere. You did. How many worlds would you cross to get back to the one you love? Imagine everything you have ever wanted. Where's my wife? This December. Work for me and get back with the woman that you love. I think the truth is that you're a liar. We'll find my Molly. The Shift. This film is not yet rated. Exclusively in theaters beginning December 1st. Go to angel.com slash the shift. Now let's go to my interview with Christopher Pala and Ken Carpenter. Welcome to the homestead, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Ken, you want to get closer to your mic? You're supposed to know these things. <laughs> it's your show, David. Your show. <laughs> so, um, first of all, I, I got to congratulate you on this trailer uh, that uh, that we just saw because uh, it I, I have to tell you, the, the first trailer I saw, I, 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 I honestly got, I thought, what are they thinking, right? Yeah. This one blew my mind, and I can't wait to go to the theater. It's great. Super. That's exactly the, the, the response we were hoping for. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and, uh, but but I, have, I have to ask you, how in the world, I mean, was this a bad dream one night of the, of the, of the uh, uh, screenwriter? I mean, <laughs> how, how did he come up with this concept? Yeah, it's remarkable, isn't it? It's uh, someone. I got a call a year and a half ago and said, um, "You're going to want to buckle your seatbelt. I'm going to send you a script, and I'm going to introduce you to a writer director." And uh, I I saw right away, David, that it, it, it well not a bad dream, but a very fascinating dream. Fascinating. And I knew it would be just such a unique path in to unpacking things related to the faith. And important uh, sidebars of romance and allegory, and it all fused together in really a way that I've never seen before. And I, I, I hope audiences are going to find that really interesting. I think so. And we, hey, we got a good trailer. <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing else. They've got a free. You, you, usually, we say trailers lie, right? How many okay. times have they right. stolen our eighteen dollars? Right. And the movie never lived up. But I, I think we're on to something yeah. that's uh, going to be new and different. Yeah. Now, I, I heard that this is based on a biblical story. You heard right. Yeah, it's the book of Job uh, set in a multiverse. If you can if you can wrap your mind around that <laughs> concept. Um, you know, you said, you asked, Ken, was this based on a bad dream? And uh, I don't mean to, I don't mean to go here on your show, David. So forgive the, forgive the, the sidestep in. But Brock actually experienced, and he's written a book about it, so I'm not talking out of school. I'm this, not is, sure. this, this is his director. Yeah, right. so Brock yeah. Heasley is the writer-director, and he's mm -hmm. a graphic artist. So he understands story 
in visual, really quick, like haiku, pop, pop, pop visual, right? So, so when Ken called me and said, we got a first time director, of course the antenna goes up and I thought two <laughs> things. One, if there's a vacuum, that'll be a fun way to step in. I didn't need to. But two, <laughs> when he said he was a, he was a graphic artist, I was like, you know what? I think he could basically storyboards a graphic artist. It's the same thing. So, uh, but Brock, his father, and this is the, this is where it goes a little deep. Uh, when he was 13 was shot. So he experienced some sort of intense trauma and then he ran a pawn shop. And then five years later, when Brock was 17, his father was killed by gunpoint. So Brock had this unbelievable and a kid of faith, right? And he had to ask why God did you let this happen? So the way that he processed his grief and his trauma was through this story Mm. and to hear it all start eight years ago with a pitch and a short $500 film, Angel Studios comes along. He has this opportunity to sit into the guild, and it literally took eight years to get it to the point where we all just kind of jump in and take over and say, "Hold on, let's let's do it this way, this way, this way." But here's this guy who used art um, to express his love for his father and the grieving process. And really, uh, when I read the script, I was standing in a tuxedo at, at Biltmore House. I was filming a Hallmark movie called Biltmore Christmas. Check it out, November twenty sixth. Only on the Hallmark Channel. Um, it's going to be a big one for them. Um, and I was standing in this tuxedo, huge mansion behind me, and Ken called me. Ken and I had worked together on Run the Race, Tim Tebow's film, a few yeah. years ago. And Ken and I became fast friends then. And he called me and said, hey, will you read this? And uh, in an hour and a half, I mean, I flipped through my little phone, page by page, and like he, it's a fever dream. And if you read it, you're like, wait, what? Because it is a multiverse <laughs> story about a guy shifting like every time you make a choice and here's the line that sold it for me um do you ever have a conversation with somebody and they're like well you said and you're like well i didn't say and you're like yeah you did you said you were going to pay the bills you're like no i didn't well in this story the idea is that there is a version of you that did say and you've been shifted and when i read that i was like how many arguments with my wife have i had (laughs) where she's like you said you were going to do the thing and i was like and that idea of like every time we make a decision, this new version of us branches out and there's a new world that we exist in and, and the idea. So it's a brilliant story. It's a really hard, it's not an easy pitch. There's no elevator pitch, but I guarantee you, um, based on his experience with trauma and grief, based on the book of Job, where you see this character just get hammered and God allows it to happen and we're tested. But then obviously Job you know, gets it all back. You see this thing and it takes place in the movie. Sorry, I just ran on a long time. No, no, no. Sorry, a little, little, little long-winded there, but... Well, you're, you're right. You can't pigeonhole the shift. It's there, There's not a easy, yeah. you know, football coach wins state championship and saves his marriage kind of thing to it. It's it's kind of complex. Or, or a man is willing to go to the ends of every universe <clears throat> to get back to the love of his life. Well, that's not bad. We could do that. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, uh, let's talk about uh, this process of getting this made because, uh, as you said, this was a, originally a short film, mm-hmm. and uh, and uh, that uh, I, we've had Neil Harmon here a couple of times, the CEO of uh, Angel, and he's explained uh, the whole idea of producing a torch. Yep. You know, he's not accepting scripts, so to speak. You, you got to go out and prove the concept, yeah. right? Um, when did you see the short film? And how did, how did you take this to Angel? How did that all happen? Because yeah. Dallas Jenkins, Jenkins also involved, right? Dallas is one of our executive producers. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's right. The the point at which I intersected with the movie was after the torch was made, and 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 the scope of the shift was growing, and they wanted to bring in someone that had been around the block a few more times, and so um, that's when I got the call to read the script, meet the writer director, and to look at the short film. And um, it was just starting to generate some enthusiasm in the crowd, the guild at Angel. And um, it's been a whirlwind since then. I think it's, th- how long did it take us to make this? Uh, five we shot, weeks. Yeah, we shot for five weeks at the top of this year and are releasing December 1. Uh, so I guess in that sense, it's come together quickly. But there was about a year before that, David, of inc- further incubating but Brock, as Chris said, had been at it for several years before then. Uh, the, the thing I love about the, their uh, proof of concept is that they take it to this guild. So there aren't, a, there, there, there aren't uh, people in the ivory tower making these decisions. 
it's it's uh, real people uh, talking about what they really want to watch. Uh, does that do you like that concept? Yeah, theoretically, um, if you have the gumption to make something uh, and you can put it in front of this guild. Yeah, it's an incredible because it's basically you're going back to the people. The, I think the idea was the the guy who designed the Statue of Liberty used crowdfunding to mm-hmm. build it in France, and so as it was a gift from France, but it was actually you know crowdfunded by angels. And I think their idea is the same thing. It's like if you want to see the piece of art, um, which is a great idea, it's a fantastic idea and concept. It, it certainly gives you a jump on selling <clears throat> tickets because there's a buy-in already from people who have a vested interest. Yeah. As, as you've heard in Hollywood a time or two, from your lips to God's ears, David. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think your pre-sales are pretty good so far, yeah. what I'm, what I'm yeah. saying. Yeah. So, so let's talk about uh, the movie itself in regards to uh, uh, the... Mm. the uh, first of all, when I saw a sci-fi picture with, with this premise of faith mixed in, I'm like, this, this is something that we haven't really seen before. Yeah. Uh, so are you a little nervous or is it, uh, what, what, what makes you so confident in this, that this is going to work? What made you think we were so confident? <laughs> <laughs> we're here talking about it. <laughs> no, you, you know what? We're, we're proud of the story we've crafted Yeah, and, uh, think, think it has shaped up very handsomely. <clears throat> you, you can't be in this business, David, and not have a, an awareness that anything could happen. Until until the team takes the field on Sunday afternoon, right? right. The verdict's out. Yeah. Um, I at the very least, I think audiences will appreciate that it's a like I said earlier, a fresh path in to unpacking things of the faith. I I think we've delivered that in a really yeah interesting way, unique way. <clears throat> so I, I want to talk a little bit about your backgrounds a little bit. Here I'm gonna move that. Wants you, oh. He wants you kissing that thing. Yeah, <laughs> get in there. I want. I want to talk about uh, Christopher. Let's talk about you. Um, sure. You're a family guy. Uh, I've, I've read some things that uh, uh, you purposely uh, accept and and uh, reject certain projects based on uh, what your boys are going to think, what your yeah. family thinks, yeah. right? Yeah. And you started making that those decisions some time ago. Tell, tell me about how difficult it is to do that in Hollywood. I think that in one breath, it's difficult because you're missing out on opportunities. Horror pictures in particular, there's a certain genre of horror films that I think that delve into the spiritual realm that frankly, it's almost like a portal and you open a door and you let stuff right in. Uh, and if you don't have the proper armor, to guard yourself with, I feel a, a, my theory is that film is just, it, it's another thing that we ingest, right? We read books, we watch movies, we bring them into us, just like we eat food, just like we listen to music and what you put in your body affects the overall health of it. And I feel like the same way with our entertainment. And if you're watching slasher movies or, or intensely perverse sexually movie, like there's certain things that kind of rot you and it's hard to shake it. We've all experienced it, right? Regardless of your faith walk, you've, ex- you've left something and being like, why is that? F- I feel like I'm, I'm walking out with this. And I just, you know, my wife and I, we talked about it and early on, I just made a decision that there were certain things that I just didn't want to, you know, be affiliated with. And I think mm-hmm. when you look at, I think there's a lot of people uh, who may not be as verbal about it, but like, you know, Clint Eastwood, you expect a certain brand with Clint Eastwood or, you know what I mean? There's a certain level of, and I just always, you know, I'll, you know, if I can put myself in the same ring as, as Clint, I just, mm-hmm. you know, I wanted to make stuff that you could take your family to. I want to take, make stuff that's hopeful. that's inspirational. Um, I started out by playing John F. Kennedy Jr. Um, my first gig was this movie, TV movie called America's Prince. And I think that set a template for, you know that that energy that I, w- I wanted to push into the world as an artist. That was pretty yeah. successful. It did. It did well. Yeah, it yeah. did really well. Forty million viewers that night from the, in the first run. It was a big big hit for them. Unless you're Taylor Swift now, who's who gets forty million viewers, right? Nope. I mean, <laughs> she does. We can she talk does. about Taylor. That's, and now Travis Kelsey gets tickets, 40 man. That's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel like the audience. I think that we. Uh, the thing I love about Angel Studios is that they're saying there's an alternative, 
And I feel like, you know, Hallmark, it's an interesting company. We, we were just having a conversation today about Hallmark. Yeah. And um, when I, I did a movie, Where Hope Grows, we mentioned earlier, and all of a sudden had tapped into this sort of faith film. And faith films, by the way, if you cut back to five, six, seven years ago, were very much preaching to the choir. And there was a certain patina to faith films. There was a certain level of professionalism. And not overall, there were some exceptions. But then all of a sudden, there started this like counter movement, which was like, we're going to make movies. We want to make really great movies. But we also want to make them based in, in Jesus or based in the Bible, biblical truths. We want to make them based in something that when you walk away from it, you can take that lesson with you, but also have a really great movie, like a Scorsese film or like something on, you know, running in that same lane. Um, and I remember I had a general meeting with Hallmark. It was before I did any of them. I had never seen the network. I've never watched one. Um, but all of a sudden, I realized that the people who are watching Hallmark movies, they get 80 million unique viewers from October to December. Mm. It's America. It's the people who just want to watch something with their family and they don't mm -hmm. want to be smacked in the face with an agenda or with a... Mm -hmm. and, and not to say that the... You know, it's like there's, there's nothing wrong with making entertainment that's has core values involved that are just talking to and that's what i loved about the shift is mm -hmm. because here it's this movie that really does exceed expectations and all of a sudden you've got the romance so there's a little bit of that you know um but you're dealing with a multiverse and you're dealing with all of this stuff that you really haven't seen before and at the end of it you're going to leave better for it i mean it really is one of those movies you're like okay it, if something awful happens in my life and I have hope and perseverance and faith in something that I cannot see, it might work out for me. Like there's that hope of what does it mean to have faith? I mean, that really, what does it mean to have faith in the life that we live in? And I'm telling you something, you, you turn on the news. <laughs> I mean, it's, we do need an escape. We don't <clears throat> need to be hit with it more. And I think that Hollywood used to, um, when the world was a bit safer and when the world was a bit calmer, I think that Hollywood used to have that wish fulfillment element. And so you'd go see a, a violent film or you'd go see a horror film because you had to, uh, you had to, that was the only place you could get it. But now, you know, you walk outside, you read the newspaper and it's scary out there. And so now I think entertainment is having to fill the need of like, no, 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 let's remember what good behavior looks like let's remember what earnest hard work looks like let's remember what and start watching that again and build those heroes up again and i don't know well i, I always felt like when i was uh in the in the old days when i put wheel of fortune and jeopardy on it was escapism yeah it was an oasis yeah for all the people that wanted to get yeah. away from the uh, noise yeah and uh, so, I, so I, no, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I, I think the Hallmark movies uh, do that. I, and I also read someplace that uh, what, was it your grandma thought that you really made it when you got on Hallmark. <laughs> Is that <laughs> no kidding? God rest her soul. She just passed on two years ago. But nanny, my little, my mom's mom, <laughs> she was like, "Well, you finally made it." <laughs> I mean, I'd been in Hollywood for at that point. I think close to, I don't know, eighteen or nineteen. I had seven TV shows. I'd done movies. I mean, I you know, I was working. And uh, in her esteem, at that point, I had made it. I was big time because I was on the Hallmark Channel. She was so, so proud. And I, I mean, I love it working for Hallmark. I started co-authoring romance novels with Anna Gomez. We've got two books published: Where uh, uh, Moments Like This and uh, Where the Sun Rises. Forgive me for shilling my books right now on your show, but it's this audience. They're as fervent and as passionate and as loyal as. Any DC movie you'd ever go want to be a part of, any Marvel like fanboy, these 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 fans and they're women and they're I and I always joke it's literally the same audience that Elvis had. It's like these women who are they just love who they love and they show up at the Christmas cons, they buy the books, they you know the movies. We'll see what happens with yeah, the tickets. They'll show up on, at the shift. Yeah, I mean they're right. already very supportive of Good. it. So uh, it has been this unbelievable blessing that God put in my life. And to be really honest with you. Your listeners are going to think I'm crazy. My wife did. Uh, I was at WME, so, you know, big, big agency. And uh, I was offered a role in a Dolly Parton movie of the week. And I hadn't done one yet. And I was like, oh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know that I want to do movies of the week yet. I don't think I want to enter into that <laughs> world yet. And uh, I regret that. <laughs> Dolly's listening. I would love to, I would love to have a second chance at working with you. Um, but uh, I, re I do regret that. Um, 
and then I think it was a year later where I did the, it was called the Dater's Handbook with Meghan Markle. And of course, within that year, she met Harry and that movie sort of was shown all over the Commonwealth and in, in introduction to who she was. Um, it was a, yeah, because before Suits had streaming, I guess, rights, but it was um, a really amazing door that God just took me through. It was like, trust me. And I needed it. I needed, I have, you know, three kids at home and mouths to feed and, so when I when I was given that offer, it was it was something that I, I it was a yeah I had it was like I had to take it you know we've all been in those situations and I, but I'm yeah. so grateful that I walked through that door. It's been just this unbelievable gift that you know, I couldn't have planned for it. Well, it's a crazy market. Uh, years ago, uh, we, we have a domain lovestories.com. Okay, and uh, but years ago I acquired that domain, and uh, it was uh, I had actually done a deal with uh, Fox to do a anthology series called love stories. Yeah. And, uh, but, but the showrunners that uh, I acquired this domain and the showrunners got fired. Uh, they were the original showrunners on, uh, that worked with, the. Uh, oh gosh. Um, oh, <sighs> they, they got canned. And so the whole show went down the drain, but I had this domain. So I started going to the romance writers of America convention yeah and it was all these women that 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 that, that read uh, romance novels yeah right and that's what romance novels yeah yeah i mean thousands of them thousands. right yeah it's just amazing and they're all hallmark people that yeah. you know level hallmark movies yeah. so you're doing uh, so how many books are you gonna do so we're gonna do five uh total we've got three two two out right now you can buy them right now Third one is ninety uh, percent finished. It'll be available next Christmas, and then Anna and I are going to do the second, fourth, and fifth of the From Kona with Love series. By our aim is twenty twenty five. Well, um, the, the good thing is that you negotiate with yourself for the yeah. rights for the movies, right? Yeah, glad we have already. Yeah, we got the first one. The first moments like this already already as a script. We're looking at Hallmark and Amazon are two uh, places that we're right now kind of looking to shop it and and see what it'll turn. But yeah, it, that was exactly it. The whole goal was, well, if I would walk in as a producer and I'd be like, I have an idea. And they'd be like, that's a great idea. What have you got? Where's the IP? Where's anything behind it? Right. And I was like, well, what, what is IP? And they're right. like, it's intellectual property. You need a magazine, you need a book, you need an article. And I was like, and so, uh, it, I mean, this is a really crazy story, which I'll, if, you know, I was in the shopping mall, uh, shopping market, getting groceries, looked at that little, you know, you, they sell the books in the grocery stores and it was all these romance novels. And I took down names of the authors and I was like, I could just cold call these women and see if they want to co-author something with me. <laughs> and I mean, again, it's God just being like, hey, I got you. My neighbor, Javier La Fianza, uh, said, I have a friend, Anna Gomez. She's a romance novelist. She wants to turn her books into movies. Would you jump on a Zoom call with her? And I said, absolutely, love to. We talked for two hours on Zoom. And by the end of it, I was like, I mean, like these all the books that you have they're more for netflix or they're a different hallmark is a very i said it's a very specific thing she said would you want to write one with me i said i think i pitched i was like if you yeah. ever wanted to just write one like we could do it we'd own the ip from page to screen it would be a really fun experience she's like well i'm doing a a series do you want to join me on that i said hold on a second it's like a whole bunch she's like yeah we got five do you want to do it with me and i was like yeah i was like you probably should talk to your husband and your agent I'll tell you know but yeah and so that was friday we checked in with each other on monday it was still a go and by wednesday i had contracts signed and then used the pandemic we wrote a it was a i think a hundred thousand word book during the pandemic and then we wrote the second one the next year and the quarantines were amazing you have 15 days of just like chick, 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 writing and I've become like, I'm, I'm like a, I'm a writer now. I've got a, another thing in development, Orson Holt, 120,000 word anthology, Hallmark, the whole thing. It's a really beautiful he, he, thing. He's a very fine actor. You're about to see, <laughs> but, but, but he wears a lot of hats, this guy. <laughs> as, do, as do you. As do I, but I, I love that. And it is, I think part of the reason we connected is that you're, you're a storyteller in front of the camera and more and more behind the camera yeah clearly clearly, um, clearly he's like ken i can't get a day we're at edgewise no 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no so it's, it's it's fun fun to watch you develop as a as a as a fully embodied storyteller Thanks, in addition to that great work you do in front of the camera thank you brother so ken what is it because you produced a lot of pictures and a lot yeah. of uh, uh family pictures uh fun things uh, romance projects 
Uh, what are the elements that you look for when deciding what you're going to work on? Yeah. Um, it, it's, it always starts, David, with what's on the page and the strength of what's on the page. My, of all my many mantras, one new one is movies are easy to talk about. It's another thing altogether to actually make one and make it well. <clears throat> and it really, if it's not on the page, as the saying goes, it won't be on the stage. You know, no good script, no good movie. They don't magically transform into a good movie. So it all that to say, it's I, I meet people all the time and get pitched ideas all the time. And I love taking those meetings, but, you know, send me the script mm -hmm. and let me get in front of those 100 to 120 pages yeah. and make sure they grab me by the lapels and don't let go. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a, I, the, the more I swim in that space, the more respect I have for that craft. It's really hard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's one thing to write one good page, one good sequence, but a hundred straight pages. Um, it's really demanding. So it's the, the, it, what, what attracts me to a project is the material and the execution of the story. And the other thing is, um, another new mantra, <laughs> Great stories, good people, healthy environments. That's what I want to keep pressing into. And um, so I'm, I'm drawn to story situations or um, production opportunities that will check all those boxes. Yes, great script. Yes, good people. And are we all going to link arms? Because guess what? It's going to get hard. And it's going to be late at night and you're going to want one more take and we're out of money. We're out of time. We're going to get to the next thing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> we're going to have to face down some tough things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, the people that we link arms with in this long, hard journey of making a movie, you, you can't overstate the yeah. importance of that. So just early on, I'm, I'm assessing, yeah, is it good on the page? And is this going to be a two year at least journey I want to take? with the people that I'm interfacing with. Yeah, because for you, it's two years. <clears throat> yeah. It's a yeah, long, often, it's a lot of process. Often longer. Yeah. But, but it's, it, I, I love what we do. I love it with everything in me. But, um, man, there's, you, you can't put a price on doing it with people that uh, walk with integrity and honor and civility and reasonability. Don't all filmmakers... Oh, maybe not. No, no. <laughs> I got an amazing story about you. Um, since you said that we were filming the climax of the shift. Yeah. And I was given the one take. <laughs> and uh, I don't think I'm talking out of school when I tell the yeah, story yeah. because it's what happened. And I was given one take and we were up against it. Like that was it. There was no more time. And something was going on. It was my close up. And this is the climax of the movie. This is the whole thing. Brock and I had talked about like all of the intricacies of it and I played it for a very specific reason with a lot of anger yeah. and it was wrong choice and it was happening you know acting is a really unusual craft because your body is doing one thing and your mind is being like no 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 and you're they're trying to like articulate all these things with your face and your voice and your all the energy and I remember it being done and then Brock was like okay we got to move on and I, I mean, and you and I locked eyes. Yeah. I looked at you. Yeah. And you looked at me and you were like, do you need one more? Yeah. I think what you said is you'll never work in this business again if I don't get one more. Was that? <laughs> no, 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 no. He didn't say I, I said I'll never work in this because it's going to be my performance. It's not going to be any good. Um, and you went to bat for me, man. You were yeah. like, I remember it. You just kind of yeah. swept in and you took care of it. It was an amazing producer yeah. moment of you being like, you know what? We're going we're gonna to build the time out to give yeah. him one more take, which was ultimately then played with love. I mean, the whole thing was yeah. Jesus. All of a sudden it was me. And that's what I should have been doing the first take. But it was like, how would Jesus do this? And then that was the, yeah. and that was you. Which one made in. the cut? Yeah, I, well, yeah. <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> Show up December 1 to see. Yeah, you'll find out. That was a great moment. Yeah, Let's talk a little bit about the changing environment. Because, uh, you know, I, I mean, every day I wake up, I'm like, the world's different today than it was yesterday. Yeah. And I was just... Uh, doing some research, additional research on AI today, and also some stock market research. Uh, the, the reality is, is that it's changing so rapidly. I mean, to get, and I, and I grew up loving movies. For many years, I critiqued movies. For many years, when, uh, when I was in the media, 
uh, I that was part of my gig was to go. And then, of course, I was in Hollywood, and I had a lot of friends that made movies. I went to I, I probably went twice a week. Yeah, right. But now you gotta. It's it's, and I don't think it's just an age thing. I think it's a. There's just so many. I, I love. I, I used to love watching movies at home, up my media room on my 75-inch TV. Now I love sitting on the deck watching it on my iPhone with a cigar. <laughs> you know, it's it's like it, it's about the story, and it's not so much for me about where I see it. Mm-hmm. It's about where I want to be in the environment that I'm in. It's like you do in Hallmark. Mm-hmm. You know, you go to that environment to be in that kind of mindset, right? right. Especially during the holidays, right? It's sort of the natural fit. But to get people into a theater now, I mean, I, by the way, I took Shelly in to see Taylor Swift. Right. Not because of Taylor Swift, but because I wanted to be in an environment with a bunch of kids dancing in the aisles. Yeah. Because that reminded me of when I took my girls to see Justin Bieber. Right. Documentary like 15 years ago or whatever it was when they were little. Mm-hmm. Right. I wanted to experience that again. So... How do you, you know, and, and this film seems to be a bit of, uh, first of all, I would love watching this film smoking a cigar, okay? Because I, I like, like uh, if I watched The Sopranos or whatever it was, and I went through this era where if everything, somebody had to get a hand cut off and everything I watched, <laughs> that, you know, I... Yeah. You know, it's a, <laughs> you and my son would not have watched <laughs> movies together. Michael was like, Ma- that was his fear. Movies, you're right. Yeah. I, I went, but but it, it's 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 this is a, an experiential film. It seems like, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, but but tell me what you think as a filmmaker now. Why you decide to do something and spend two years of your life doing it? Yeah. I mean, let let's start with that. I mean, especially you can. It's a couple years of your life, yeah. and now as I get closer to the fourth quarter, you know, I'm sitting there going, "Is it really worth yeah. two years?" Yeah. You know, and I'm sure you kind of go through that a little bit. Yeah. It's not like, oh, "Can I just get a gig? Can I put food on the table?" I mean, we go through that too. Mm-hmm. You that you probably yeah. yeah that's probably more you than me at this point because yeah. of, my point is like I got every 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 decision. <clears throat> has got to count right right it's not just hey i got a gig isn't that nice right (laughs) right but what goes through your mind in deciding is it really worth my time and is it going to end up in the right place so that that time proves to be a a good call yeah well two things yes it takes an extraordinary amount of time to make a movie and see it all the way through. But the truth of the matter is we're working on other things simultaneously. So we've, I mean, the producer of life is to have other projects incubating and gestating. So all your eggs aren't just in that one basket. Um, But, you know, to your question of, um, and and by the way, I'll get you a copy so you can watch it. it. It's worth seeing two times, I think, David, Second time with a cigar, first time on the big screen. Yes. Oh, and, absolutely. Yeah. Can and we it's broker two that different deal? experiences okay. yeah, by far. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I'd love to join you when, for the second time. <laughs> um, you're on. But, but, but yes, to the question of whether it should be on the big screen in your home or on the big screen at the multiplex. Um, this particular story, and Chris and I were just in Hollywood last week finishing the movie. Uh, it's so immersive visually and so immersive uh, the audio. And the, and the world that we take viewers to that just the storytellers in us want people to experience that in a darkened theater um, without phones going off there's just something about that and the, and the great news whether we're drinking the Kool-Aid or not is this summer has proven that people are going back to the movies and people want that experience they want to go see the Ohio State Buckeyes live if they can not just on TV now and then, that, that'll that work, smoking a cigar and watching, but being in the stadium, mm-hmm. that's a different experience. And we feel that way about movie going. Mm-hmm. And I think, and you know, the good news in, Amer- in America is, you know, there aren't that many things to do on Friday night, you know? Right. And we still like that. We crave that. We want that communal experience. So, um, yeah, it is a case by case assessment, but the shift. I think just said from the outset, show me, show me in a dark theater on a big screen. 
and I'm I'm gonna piggyback on your answer. I am such an advocate for going to see a movie in a movie theater. I love it. Mm -hmm. And I'm 46, but I can tell you, Tootsie, my parents took me to see Tootsie oh, yeah. when I was a little tiny boy. I remember exactly what theater we were in, where we were sitting in it, Chariots of Fire. Yep. I could tell you where we were in the theater. E.T. could tell you where we were, what theater. I could tell you almost to a movie where I was when I saw it, when I saw it in a movie theater. And there was something sacred. And I don't use that word lightly, but it's sacred space and it's dark. And there's light projecting through darkness and it's bouncing off of a silver screen. It's bigger than life. You're flooded with sound. You're flooded with something yeah. visual and you're in a room with strangers. And that communion that happens, I can't, like, I love doing stuff until, and I do. You, the Hallmark sets a tone. You sit at home, it's cozy, but you're, in, it's interrupted. You, you got laundry, you got food to cook, you got kids talking to oh. you, you got commercials. Commercials. <laughs> But when you go see a movie, it is uninterrupted. You are giving yourself over to the story for two hours, and you're asking to be transported somewhere. I love it. I love making movies. I don't think it's going anywhere. I mean, I think you're right. I think phones competing, and I think there's a lot of competition for it. But I think in our hearts, it's the campfire. Yeah. We want to sit around totally. that campfire together and hear a story <laughs> being told well. I think that's, that's not going anywhere. As That's long good. as I'm around, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, <laughs> yeah. as long as they pay me to, to tell stories, I'll, I'll be there. No, that's good. That's good. I, li I like that uh, explanation. I like that description. <clears throat> and I like the fact that you put um, the shift in the same company as Tootsie and uh, E.T. Yeah. <laughs> I just did that, didn't I? <laughs> I think I mentioned Martin Scorsese at some point. I think, oh, yeah. What am I doing? <laughs> You, you you know David that we're in that season of not jinxing the movie. I'm not jinxing it. It's terrible. Don't go see it. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Lower expectations. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's good. So Christopher, tell me about your upbringing and uh, have you always been a believer? Um, so my faith walk, I think. I mean, it's particularly interesting to me because it's my 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 faith walk and uh, grew up in a Christian household. Um, my mom. Dad was Catholic. Dad is Catholic. Uh, Mom, sort of any evangelical preacher that rolled through Reno, Nevada, you know, we would go to like the tent revivals and all that stuff. So Holy Spirit led churches mostly. And I always had this intense relationship with the Holy Spirit. First dream I had in color was with Jesus. I was at the feet of Jesus and it was grass. It was, I think it was a picture I'd seen from a children's Bible. Anyway, I had this unbelievable relationship. And when I was 17, I got filled with pride. And I said, Lord, I want to know. I mean, I had, I was the lead of all the plays and I, you know, girls were checking me out. Like it was all very good stuff happening for a 17 year old kid. And I remember praying really specifically in the fall of my junior year of high school. And I said, Lord, I want to know if this is you doing all this cool stuff in my life or if it's me. And I don't know why, I don't know why or where. The prayer came from but it really was a, a prayer of pride and i said i'm not going to pray for six months i'm just gonna i'm gonna discontinue the relationship i'm gonna put the relationship on hold for like six months and i'll get back to you and that six months turned into a six year sort of wandering through the wilderness and in that time god accepted to nyu still identified as a christian i still was like you know what i mean it wasn't like i was not a christian anymore but it was just the relationship I, what, I, what, I, what I realized later was that I was afraid if I gave God everything that he would say, you know, I don't want you to be an actor. I want you to be a preacher. I want you to be. And so I was afraid that if I gave my acting over to God, I wasn't going to get it. So I think selfishly, I was like, let me hide this. Uh, and anyway, ended up, I mean, I went around the world on a boat to, to sort of be more like Eugene O'Neill the playwright because he had gone on a boat around the world. I mean, I was so intense and I wanted to go for Mount Everest as an actor. I mean, I was, I was so into the, and I think I, I probably idolized it. Um, <clears throat> and then I, one night, October 21st, I almost died. And uh, the guy was trying to burn his restaurant down and he blew, he, he lit a fire in the basement, five gallons of gasoline and some trash. The whole thing ignited. Uh, and very quickly, I'll tell you, you fan, your, your listeners the story. I was with a friend of mine, Catherine Smith, and she was on the inside and I was on the outside of the street. And I moved about a block before so that I was on the inside. So now I was between her and the building. And I was wearing this thick leather jacket, sheep shear, so the wool on the inside, the leather on the out, cords, 
thick hiking boots. She was in jeans, tennis shoes, a t-shirt, and a windbreaker that I let her borrow. It was a warm night for New York City in October 20, late fall. And um, we were singing. We were being goofballs. And all of a sudden, we had this tick, 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 And out of the grate of the sidewalk, this fireball bursts out. We're surrounded by a fireball. And then it goes back in like backdraft, tears through the restaurant, blasts out the window. And all I remember is seeing one of those pizza things that you deliver the pizza in kind of float by in slow motion. But here's the miracle. We are now standing in a lane of traffic. There's a red light. So there's no traffic in New York City on 6th Avenue. I'm facing the World Trade Towers, which are still standing at the time. She's facing the Empire State Building. She's north of the blast. I'm south of the blast. Now, it doesn't make sense because I should have been knocked into her. We should have tumbled into the street. We shouldn't. Have. The fire marshal later was like, it's a miracle. You guys should be decapitated. Like something happened. So for me, it was as if God kind of just reached down, moved us. So in that moment, when I almost died and I thought my face, I had, I mean, this was cut. This was 80 stitches on my face, 120 stitches total. I thought my face was, I didn't know what was going to happen as an actor, you know, your you, moneymaker, whatever. And in that moment, I said, God, I don't know what you want, but it was like this, I, my heart just, ra- it, like Jesus rushed in. And the thing I forgot to say was on that world tour, the two things I studied was world religion and th- theater around the world. So I wanted to study Shintoism and Buddhism and Hinduism and Judaism and Muslim. I wanted to go to the temples. I wanted to see why and what, because I knew I was you know, a Christian. And of course, my roommate's a guy named Ryan Johnson, just on fire for Jesus. And he's like, buddy, from Georgia. He's like, man, you, you're going around the world looking at Shintoism and Buddha. He's like, you read the Bible yet? <laughs> and I'm like, and all of a sudden, God just in the middle of NYU, in the middle of all of this sort of idolatry for the acting and wanting to be the next Marlon Brandt, wanting to be just great. Um, Jesus was just like, Whoa. now this thing that he began, that was 1997, really came to fruition in 2017. It took me 20 years, mm. and I still wrestled with not enough, not big enough. It's a show, but it's not a... Still wrestling with pride, still wrestling with like me wanting and not really truly letting go. Now I meet my wife. My wife is this amazing Christian woman. Her father preached with Billy Graham, went and got to talk at Martin Luther King's church, the first preacher in Florida to preach against anti-segregation, uh, had crosses burning on his yard. Amazing amazing Christians. So all of a sudden with her, I start to, my faith gets refined and all of a sudden God starts working on me in a whole brand new way. We have kids, we have our life, everything's happening. And in prayer, I'm able to just give it away. I'm like, Lord, my children are yours. Do with him what you want. Lord, our finances are yours. Do with it what you want. But I'm still not able to give my career away in the wildest way. And Things are. This is around the time I accept the Hallmark thing. Financially, we are just hit hard. We're 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 barely getting by, and um, which is where you come in Dude. around the first time. Uh, and I'm. It's 2016, I think, or 2017 around this time. And I used to go hiking up in our house. Uh, I called it the Holy Road, and I would just. There were days where I would just fall on my hands and knees. I didn't care who was coming down the trail, and I would just pray. And I'd just be, Lord, take it. And one night I was I was reading the New Testament to my kids as they fell asleep. They fell asleep and I started praying. And I said, Lord, I said, I have never just given you my career. And I'm so sorry that I haven't. But I just want to give it to you. Like, do with me what you will. And if you want me to keep acting, I'll keep acting. But it doesn't feel good anymore. It doesn't taste good anymore. There's no joy in it anymore. Like, I don't want it. Uh, if it's not going to be for you and to glorify your kingdom and to move this thing forward so it's yours, take it. And man, it's like instantly Wonder Woman 1984, Jurassic World, Hallmark Universe, this movie. I mean, who knows? I don't know. And it's almost like you don't want even want to, it's not mine anymore, but there's this beautiful thing when you just give it to God, like let God have it. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's, I'm a work in progress and I'm still, I'm still kind of daily doing my thing. But I think that our purpose, whether it be if we're acting or if we're running a podcast or for a dentist or whatever it is that we're doing, 
that we have an opportunity to push the kingdom forward and like Jesus said to bring the kingdom of heaven here it's at hand it's here right now and when you're on set to treat everyone with kindness to be somebody that it's you know we're co-workers we're all here together and we're all doing something and there's no and we're getting to shine light just to be that light you know and so I think that's kind of the new that's kind of where it's ended up that's kind of where we're at wow and where would you like to end up how, how, would, how would you like to be remembered well <laughs> <laughs> um, two things I'll tell you two stories one on that holy road it was truly a moment of epiphany it was really like living like step by step in the Holy Spirit and being financially dependent on God if you're out there listening and you've and you feel like you can trust your own resources I have miracle after miracle of being like I had 80 bucks at one point and I had enough money to buy groceries for my family or buy gas to get to an audition in hopes that I could get a job and then the phone would ring or a, che- a residual check would drop which is you know God bless Zach for striking I it was really hard and I'm <laughs> so grateful for people who, who you know waited for everybody to do that because the the backbone of the industry was broken and the residuals were have been these little gifts out of nowhere where you're like whoa we just we just got another month um but uh two things happened one was this idea of being a star and i had this thought of like you know i'd rather be the moon and reflect the sun's light like let's not make it about me anymore and then i used to want to uh you know remind people of marlon brando when i acted and god was like what if you reminded people of me <laughs> Like, what if you reminded people of me when you act like Jesus? Like, what if all of a sudden they started feeling that vibe off of you versus, and it really changed my whole mindset. So, I mean, I don't know. I'd love to be remembered as a, you know, a great storyteller. And I'd, I'd love to find my niche in this country. And I'd love to be able to tell stories for a long, long time. And, but the legacy I'm building is with my kids, my wife, you know, I think that's the, the paramount thing. The people that come into it, the personal stuff. I don't know. So, so uh, let, let's uh, let's uh, finish this up by uh, telling me uh, what you think about the um, the magic, the camaraderie, uh, the um, the reason that uh, God has given you the opportunity to all work together on a picture like this, and what impact you hope it makes with the audience yeah i'll start yeah. and you can take us home but um for, for me david this group of storytellers i think are embracing and recognizing <clears throat> that we are in the middle of a really dynamic exciting alluring time in whatever you call this arena we work in faith adjacent faith accessible faith friendly <clears throat> Um, but but I, I think what distinguishes this time in that arena is a, an evolving market appetite with audiences that are saying, uh, or at least as I'm got, as I have my ear to the ground, are saying, give us increasingly stronger stories that represent our faith, that integrate our faith that are consistent with the foundational things that are most important to us, but they have a commitment to a high level of craftsmanship in terms of the storytelling, the writing, the acting, the cinematography. It's, it's really sort of a pioneering time. Um, a lot of doors have been opened in the previous decade with some trailblazing kind of expressions that finally identified there's an audience out there um, for faith film or whatever you want to call it. But I think it's, we're, we're finding ourselves, it, it, the, the bar is raising and the demands are higher. And I love that challenge. And um, budgets are increasing, audiences are increasing. It's giving us the chance to build things with a higher level of artistry, which I think in the end honors our creator in the way he should be honored through this expression. And so... Um, the shift with all its newness and uniqueness um, and all the groundbreaking, that's an overstatement, all the uh, freshness to the story really, really just brings together a group of people that um, I, I, I think are very forward looking and I'm really honored to be a part of it. 
Yeah, that's beautifully said, man. Um, you guys just did Surprised by Oxford, yeah. which is, to your point, a gorgeous movie. Thank you. That elevates, and it's high-minded. You're, you're talking about really amazing stuff, C.S. Lewis and all that she goes through. There's a verse. Let me see if I can find it. I should memorize it. Uh, but it says, I will use stories to reveal secrets that have been hidden since the beginning of the universe. It's this amazing idea, and Jesus used stories um, to teach. And there's something really valuable about an amazing story told well. And I think exactly to your point, and kind of where we started the interview, is that there used to be um, a certain patina that went along with faith films. And the expectancy of what a faith film is today, or faith adjacent film, is they want quality. You want to be able to go to the movies and, and just and not feel like you're being, you know, given a, a you know, a sermon. Yeah. And, <laughs> And uh, working with the right kind of people, um, when you can collaborate, being an actor, being a grown man and being an actor is a tough pill to swallow because you're effectively told where to stand, what to say, what to wear. It's not always like, you know, it's not, it's not the, it's not, it's not, it's not everything it's made out to be. (laughs) And when you have, you know, ideas, as I like to fancy myself as having, you want to be in an environment where those or listen to and appreciate it and you can collaborate with and you know working with a guy like Ken all of a sudden it's like well here here's an idea and then all of a sudden it becomes best idea wins and it may not be your idea but at least you've got a group of people who are all saying we've got a problem how do we fix it oh this is a really fun creative way to fix it this is inventive this is not gonna and then all of a sudden it's a community of people collectively building something and telling a story and if everybody has a share in that it becomes a wonderful way to make a living it's just a fun way to like you know, like we're working on something else right now and yeah. we're in the very beginning stages of putting this piece, all these little pieces together. And it's just thrilling to be able to yeah. make a call and have somebody say yes. And then all mm-hmm. of a sudden it opens these doors and you're like, okay, this is fun. Like we're, we're building something. Yeah. Sweet. That's <laughs> nice. That's nice. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I, I wish you two uh, much success. Uh, I know that uh, uh, so far, Ticket sales have been good pre, on pre-sales. Pretty yes. good. And uh, we'll we'll put a link up where people can get tickets. Great. How many theaters is this going into? Uh, that's still being determined. They've. Uh, I'm being told that it'll be at least 2,000 screens. Oh, not and, bad. Uh, yeah, and as we get more traction, we'll add from there. Yeah, but yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good, robust open. Well, fantastic. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for stopping by, and uh, thank you for uh, doing what you do. And just keep up the good work. Thanks, man. Thanks, David. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Ken. Thanks for stopping by the Homestead. This shift hits theaters on December the 1st. Uh, You can get your tickets at the link right there on your screen or at the theater. Make sure you get to the theater on December the 1st. It's going to be a great time from Angel Studios. This has been CIA Contagious Influencers of America from the producers of Keep the Faith. Please do rate and review us. Check out our website at contagiousinfluencers.com and our radio show website at keepthefaith.com. I'm David Sams. Go out there this week and live that life in living color because it sure is a heck of a lot more interesting than living it in black and white. I'll see you next time.